Welcome back to Beyond the Buzzer, the podcast that examines how focusing on your future during your playing days is the ultimate game plan. I'm Abu Diel Katan. And I'm Sam Douglas. And today we've got a great episode for you guys. Yes, we do. Today we've got Fadi Al Khatib, a legend of Lebanese and Middle Eastern basketball, El Tigre, as they call him, 11 time Lebanese basketball champ, four time FIBA Asia Champions Cup, two time Asia Champions Cup All Star, and honestly, so much more. On top of everything he's accomplished on the court, Fad is also a phenomenal entrepreneur, launching multiple businesses and really embodying what we mean when we say athletes need to look beyond this, the buzzer. Fadi, welcome to the show. Is there anything we missed? <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it was more than uh, what I deserved. Thank you, guys. And uh, really, it's a pleasure to, have, to be here. Fadi, the first segment of our podcast is called the Shot Clock Section. We'll be asking you a bunch of questions and you've got three minutes to answer them. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's go. What was the highlight of your career, Fadi? The highlight of my career, probably the buzzer beater against Riyadh's game in the final uh, in, uh, in Tromville. What is your morning routine? Wake up, have a coffee, train. Messi or Ronaldo? Ronaldo, definitely. What's your go-to cheat meal? Anything with carbs, ma mainly Italian food. <laughs> what music do you listen to before a big game? Honestly, I listen to uh, Mashar al Afasi. That's, uh, you know, uh, dua, always. What is your favorite activity to do with your family? Beach. Favorite basketball player playing right now? Playing right now, I would say I love Tatum a lot. LeBron or MJ? MJ. <laughs> what, what is your least favorite sport? Table tennis. <laughs> Best player you ever played against? Boris Diaw. Last place you went on a vacation? Um, uh, Turkey. Best player you ever played with? There is a lot, but uh, I would say uh, definitely Elim Shantaf and Smile Ahmed. Favorite team you played for? Sajas. Worst business mistake you made? 2005 rent car company. Last basketball game you watched? Lama uh, in the finals, Riyadh and, uh, and Beirut's final. Although I don't watch basketball, but I had to because she's a great friend. Favorite sport outside of basketball? Uh, paddle. Okay, we got through most of them. I'm going to go ahead and start with one reflection. I don't know why all you old guys always stick to MJ over LeBron. LeBron is that's, the greatest uh, player of all time. This is the fact. No, no, no. <laughs> don't go into... into Come on, we go by championships, baby. <laughs> uh, you will lose. You will lose if you go into this uh, <laughs> argument. You played for the gold, Riyadi, and you played for Shanville. Tell me the difference between all three of them and why did you choose because first of all, I you know I love I love uh, the three clubs and uh, you know it was an honor playing with them and winning you know championship with every team of uh, of them. So I won the championship with Riyadh, Shomfil, and Sajas. But the thing with Sajas is you know it's the rising we were the you know the the hub and the rising of basketball in Lebanon it was from Sajas by winning the you know the Asian championship, Arab championship, and you know the exposure. Uh, uh, basketball had back in uh, the days it was because of Sajas and you know I played probably the most years with them I won 21 out of 24 titles for Sajas so it's it's uh, it was it was an honor to play in that team and uh, with the president Shwairi back in the days and all the team and you know what what was happening uh, to basketball. So the moments, I cannot forget the moments because, you know, Lebanon was going out from a war and it was much needed uh, to the people in Lebanon that, you know, something really, uh, a victory that, you know, they can see or uh, something to give them happiness. And, you know, suggest was the happiness for them. And um, we saw it in their eyes and we were extremely happy to do the, what we have done and the achievements we've done. 
Fadi, by the way, the number 21 out of 24, that's an insane number of championships. Yeah, yeah. Crazy number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, uh, and the three championships that I didn't win, it was because I wasn't in the team. I was too young to be in the team. So, uh, mm. since, since I entered Sages, I have won, you know, all the titles with them. Well, we're going to get into your basketball prowess shortly. Fadi, we finished up the shot clock uh, section of our podcast. Now we're going into the main section. Are you ready for this? Yes. Go ahead, Sam. Fatty, um, I know you probably get asked this question a lot. When was the first time you picked up a basketball? And when was the first time you realized you were that good? But I really want you to take me back. Why did you pick up a basketball? Who was behind you picking up a basketball? And how did the love really start? Well, it was in, in the high school. Um, I used to love football and I used to play football in the high school a lot and, uh, you know, under the house and football was, you know, my main thing. And then when uh, Roro, Coach Roro, a friend, a brother and a family to us, he saw me around the high school and uh, I was playing in the team of, uh, of, of the school for, for, for football. So he saw me, I have, you know, the size, I'm tall. And he told me, I want to win the basketball team. He took me, I remember, he took me and he, you know, gave me the ball. And he started working with me a bit. And directly, man, I felt something that I've never felt in my life. You know, I was, I was there, you know. I was doing the things uh, without training, without working out, without, you know, it's, it's a... Uh, and he told me, you're skilled. You, you have it. And all you need is to work on the coordination, you know, and, uh, and here, here it goes. I started my journey with Roro and uh, he gave me a lot. He trained me, he worked out with me. He didn't even stop, uh, you know, uh, working me out. And um, I won everything in the high school. And I remember I was averaging 53 points in the high school after a year and a half. So uh, Roro was was uh, was then a main person to push, you know, Fadi into basketball. Fadi, did you have like after you started playing basketball, did you like set a goal? You know what? I want to go pro. I want to get to the highest level. Were you that type of thinker where you actually? talk to yourself and kind of motivate yourself and set goals? Until, you know, Roro took me to Riyadi back then, you know, I was young, I was 14 years old, 13 and a half, 14 years old, and he took me to Riyadi to, you know, to be in the, in the uh, uh, second division or third division team. And uh, it wasn't, back in the days, it wasn't the age groups. We had no age group. So at division one, two, three, four, uh, divisions and he took me to the okay. to to Riyadi and I was probably in the fourth division and uh, you know by the time I went to the second division it was probably in two three months and then from second to first division to be practicing with the with a big team and getting a little bit of minutes I was like you know now. I see myself into this and I will not stop. I want to achieve and I was seeing Yasser, Walid, Eli, Eli Nasser, Jasem, Bulos, all the players, you know, playing. And I was, you know, in the stadium uh, cheering for uh, for the team. So and I said, you know what, when Sajess approached me and they wanted me at the age of 16, I was like, you know, and, and uh, back then, uh, Shwairi said that, uh, he got something and Ghassan brought me to the team and I uh, said, you know, I want to be the best player. I want to reach to be the best, you know, the best and I will work hard to, to, to accomplish this. Uh, I started believing in myself and my ability. Fadi, you named a bunch of Lebanese legends there, but your career also took you across the path of arguably the greatest Jordanian player of all time, sitting with us right now on the podcast, Sam Douglas. What yeah. is your first memory of playing against Sam? Did you know he was going to be great right away? Can you walk us through that, that moment? When Sam and me met, it was in 2003. 
in California, Orange County. And, you know, I didn't even know Sam. He's Jordanian. Uh, we were working out with the same agent and uh, same facility. And I was preparing to be drafted to the, to the NBA. And it's the year I was drafted to the Clippers. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I didn't have my clearance from Lebanon. But I met Sam over there, and Sam didn't know, he knew probably a little bit about the region, and he, he spoke to me about the opportunity for him to go to Jordan and to take this opportunity, and he was taking my advice, and I was pushing him really hard to do that. I saw someone, you know, with a great size, amazing vision, amazing skills, outstanding uh, passing ability. Uh, you know, he got it all. And I was like, Sam, you know, you will dominate everyone if you, you have to take it. You cannot not do this step. And I was pushing him really within, you know, the one month, two months we spent together, pushing him really hard. And, you know, the connection happened directly when we've met over there. And then, um, you know, time flies back and then we met, we started meeting in the West Asia and we started meeting in the Asian championships and in the Arab championship. And, you know, till up to today, you know, our, our relationship has been going amazing, but I knew his, his, is definitely uh, the best who, who came to Jordan. He's, he's definitely one of the best that ever played in Asia, ever, not only played in, in Asia back in the days, ever played in Asia. And um, I mean, he's an outstanding player, an amazing person. That's uh, to be, to be, uh, you know, to be honest. Sam, before I let you talk about your first impression of Fadi, I want to I want to double tap on something you said, Fadi, if you don't mind. So you mentioned being drafted by the Clippers, but then not getting the clearance from Lebanon. This is a topic we've discussed a lot with various guests about the difficulties of playing sports in the Middle East. Can you just dive into that a little bit? What happened and whether or not you still have any regrets about that? No, no, no. I don't have regrets, but it was the team that stopped me to go there. You know, but they didn't want to give me my clearance and it was obvious why. Uh, I don't want to go into details because the person who, uh, who not, who, who took this decision is, is, uh, is my second father. And, um, um, I know that there, there, you know, the people behind him were playing in his mind not to do this move because they were putting you know, stuff that isn't uh, the reality. And, um, you know, and it happened. But I regret, I never regret. I have an amazing family. I had an amazing career. And, uh, you know, I serve my country and I'm, I'm honored, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm super happy for what I've done to, to my country and to my family. And I say, you know, if, probably if I would have went to the NBA, I wouldn't have this amazing family. I would have this amazing career in the region. So thanks God, you know, um, I'm, I'm super satisfied and happy for, uh, for what I've done. That's the mentality of a winner. Sam, why don't you walk us through when you first met Fadi, what your impression was and his impact on your career? Uh, I mean, first of all, I want to thank you for the generous and the kind words, Fadi. Um, I want the viewers to know Fadi's name was known in most households in the U.S. before social media even existed. Remember, 2002, 2003, 2001, social media wasn't even like today. But yet, here's Sam Douglas playing college ball, and I was always hearing the name Fadil Khatib. And I remember when I used to come home from Texas to uh, my mom's house and watching TV and watching some of the Suggest games, and I just hear his name and seeing him compete, and I'm like, First of all, first impression was like 6'6", body strong. And then when you finally get to meet him, and uh, you meet the passion behind this ball player named Fatty. And what a great person he is. I mean, we instantly connected. And for people that don't know Fatty and or seen him dominate the Lebanese level and the Asian level, Fatty was dominating NBA names in those workouts. We had some NBA 
big time players. And I know Fetty doesn't like to talk about himself a lot. And most of the workouts he had in a lot of NBA workouts, he dominated. The feedback that I was getting from my agent, because I was always checking up on him. Fatty will go into the workout and literally kill it. So, I mean, when I say Fatty change Lebanon basketball, Middle East basketball, and how an Arab basketball player should perceive himself, he is by far the player that actually pushed me and pushed so many players to want to do more and reach high, uh, high rankings, well, let's say. That's an excellent segue into my next question. So my first experience meeting Fadi was when he was already retired and my team was doing preseason in Lebanon at the Champs Gym that you first founded. And I think at that time, Fadi, you were like 43, already retired, and you're playing against a bunch of like in their prime 28-year-olds and you scored 40 points on us. <laughs> but what was clear from that moment was that even in your retirement, you demanded excellence from everyone around you, not just on the court during the game, but off the court as well in how your players interacted with us. So one of the things Sam and I wanted to unpack was, can you walk us through sometimes what the reaction might be when you hold yourself to such a high standard and you expect everyone else around you to be high, to be held to the same standards? Did you ever get any pushback from teammates, from coaches, from federations because you were demanding so much excellence? When you run on a, on a certain level and you're, you know, you're playing on a certain level, people will not accept any, you know, downgrade in your game. If, if you're averaging 30 and you go down to score 20 points and, you know, everyone will start talking why he's averaging 20 points. If, although if a player now is scoring 17, 18 points, that's a huge deal for, you know, for a player. And, Yes, I got a lot of pushbacks from, from the Federation, from my teammates, from my coaches. A lot of, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we're, not perfe- we're not perfection. You know, there is no perfection in life. You have your ups and you have your downs, but it's all about your uh, mentality, how to, you know, overcome everything you're passing through and then, you know, challenge yourself to play at, uh, at the same level you were playing before. And you will not reach anywhere in, in your career if you don't want to compete every single day in your practices, in your friendly games, in your one-on-ones that you're going to be playing with your friends or your teammates or two-on-two or three-on-three. If you're going to be loose and not competing, you will not improve and you will not develop. Yeah, I mean, people can say what they want to say, but at the end of the day, Fadi, your your basketball resume speaks for itself. You've got seven gyms in Dubai. You've got a couple in Lebanon. You had a successful you know, laundry business that we're going to get into a little bit. So ultimately, the way you live your life and the, the way you demand excellence obviously paid off. But just out of curiosity, did you ever have times in your career where maybe teammates didn't rise to your level? And if so, how did you ever handle that? It's very hard. I mean, especially that if if, uh, if the team is not set up, uh, it's set it up in the proper way, or the coach didn't properly do the right, you know, picks, and you have to deal with what you have. I mean, and to adapt and to realign and to make things work in the proper way, and, you know. And and at the end of the day, you see some coaches now on the days that I played with, and they go and uh, you know. Uh, they talk and uh, as if they know basketball, and they probably are the you know uh, are the people that they need to sit home doesn't even interfere in basketball because their career were based on on someone else's success, and their success were you know were based on 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 my success, and uh, out of a sudden that they're now talking into technicalities and basketball and the game of basketball and you see like you know you failed you know most of your career and you won most of your career because you were with this guy you know Abudi before I go to my next question um, I kind of feel with Fatty and it's kind of bullshit because I did hear some of these interviews that are going on um, especially former coaches of Fatty that they feel it's the right for them to come out and say the experience when they coach Fatty. And I know for a fact that if it's fat, Fatty's front of them one-on-one, they won't say those things. But I guess they want that extra follows or the extra 
publicity on the social media where they come out in these interviews. And it's actually bullshit to me. Yeah. But again, this goes back to what I said. Look at Fadi. He's sitting, taking a podcast with his gym behind him. He's got seven different branches. Let him talk. Uh, Let him talk. Uh, la, la, let him talk. Yeah. But you know, Abudi, when you live, when you live with someone for, for years of your life and you work hard, inside and outside the court to be, you know, supporting these people. And, you know, at the end of the day, they're part of your family. And then out of a sudden that they are denying what they used to say and what they used to do. But, you know, that's, to me, these are lessons. And I say it, don't ever get mad from this. These are lessons in life. I teach my kids this. Just see and adapt and overcome. And this is... And I, I always say success, I don't want to talk about. What I want to talk about is all the obstacles, the challenges and failures, losses that happened in my life. And they were the only reason why I'm here now. Success wasn't the reason why I'm here now. The failures and the losses and the, the, the obstacles, the challenges that I faced in my life made me who I am now. Because it made me stronger mentally, physically, uh, you know, I'm, start seeing stuff. Yeah, start seeing stuff from a different perspective, seeing people from different perspective. Because now when you give trust 100% to people and they betray you, you will be completely down. And then, you know, there is this quote, expect nothing and you'll never be disappointed. So don't expect from people to give you back. Give and don't expect to get to get back. Just give your two hundred percent. Speaking of giving, Fatty, do you feel like is Fatty interested in giving the Lebanese Federation tips or being part of the Federation to help the basketball game grow, or do you feel the Federation are intimidated by Fatty's experience and what he's done? You know, I don't want to, I don't want to highlight on this a lot, but, you know, having, uh, I say consultant or an experienced person who've done a lot to his country and, uh, you know, uh, not at least, you know, phone call him from time to time and ask him about what he thinks. Uh, the vision and should be done in, in basketball in Lebanon. That that uh, you know that says say, say it all. You know, and uh, it's, it's an answer to what you are saying. And I don't honestly, Sam. I don't want to interfere and or give or I'm close friends with you know Sharbel and you know most of the guys over there. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, there is behind the scene people that doesn't want Fadi to be involved and behind the scene people that have are jealous from Fadi on what he's doing Fadi and what Fadi is is uh, is is uh, succeeding in his business and his career previously and now as an entrepreneur all this they you know and this is our problem our culture as an arab or lebanese Mostly, I'm not saying the highest percentage is they don't like the success to other people. Instead of loving it and, you know, supporting it, we go and sit and start talking and, uh, you know, uh, uh, not supporting the people around us. If I see a successful person from my own uh, people or from the close people to me, or I will go and, su- and support him in every way possible. But when you see, you know, you're getting um, uh, hate and jealousy mm-hmm. and doubts and, 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 you'll be like, I will, uh, I will move forward. Um, uh, I had enough in my career that, uh, and I faced a lot in my career from, uh, from all this. I don't need these people around me. So uh, I don't want to be involved. Well, look, Fadi, I think we could spend the whole episode talking about this or even just talking about your basketball career. But something that makes you such a good guest for us is the fact that you've done so much beyond the game, right? You're so much more than a basketball player. So we know that you started your first business when you were 27, right at the peak of your career. But 
Can you start off by telling us just rattling off some of the businesses, both successes and failures that you've started? And then we'll dive into how you were able to balance both business and basketball at the same time. At that time, you know, 25 years old, I started my rent company. And I told you this was the biggest lesson I've learned in my life. And I wasn't on top of my business. And we had the best rent car company in Lebanon, me and my friend. And because I wasn't on top of it, the company was completely going great. Out of sudden, uh, you know, the guy did something bad. The company lost everything. And uh, and I learned a lesson because I was a silent partner. And um, after that, two years after that, I opened my cleaning and disinfecting company, me and my wife and uh, her brother. And um, we, we uh, since then until today, it's, it's one of the biggest in Lebanon and uh, it's called Zone 15. And, uh, you know, the first nine months, it was a hassle to me. And, uh, you know, my, my staff at the office used to come to, you know, inside my office and tell me, you know, we have to stop the company. The company is losing and we cannot continue like this. And I told them, you know, give me three months and you'll see where we will be. And, you know, I did it. I challenged myself and I said, you know, this company will work, will work. And I was on top of everything until we reached, you know, where we should reach. And since then, 2000, we're talking about almost eight, 15, 16 years until now. And we're, we're doing great. Can you tell me just some of the, just for, for the viewers, what are some of the lessons you learned from the first failure up until when you took over as more active partner in the second business? Be on top of everything. Man. If you want to go into business, invest, you have to be on top of things. You cannot let it go. I mean, you have to be involved in financials. You have to be involved in the vision and the mission and the structure. And you have to be on top of things, especially if you're putting your money in uh, or you're putting your name in. And um, why? Because you cannot rely on everyone and anyone. Uh, being on top of things now, if, if, if Sam leaves his business and he relies on his staff, then the deliverables will not be there. If I will do the same thing, I, you know, the deliverables will not be there. The standards will not be there as you want. And the financials will not be that uh, controlled and structured as you want. So the advice is enter a business, be on top of it. I say be on top of it doesn't mean that you have to manage it, but be involved in a weekly uh, reports and a weekly uh, 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 checkup and, you know, everything about the company. So this is a must. Was there any sort of any difficulties in managing a business so hands-on while also sort of achieving the peak of your basketball career? Yeah, it was, it was tough. It was completely tough. I mean, I was managing Zone 15 and I was uh, uh, the sole, you know, manager and operator and CEO of the company. And uh, it was completely tough with reaching around 400, 500, uh, um, you know, cleaner in the company and, you know, managing uh, this, supervisors and the cleaners and the deliverables and how structured you need to be. And all this is, is a hassle. And at the same time, I was playing basketball and I had a lot to give into basketball because I have my workouts in the morning, I have my workouts in the night, and I have my work during the day and I have my family I need to be with. So it was, and, and it gave me a lot of commitment and discipline and it gave me a lot of challenge uh, to myself to do it and to succeed in it and again if I wasn't mentally ready for this I wouldn't have succeed and then until I moved to China in 2014 and then when my wife started to handle the company because I'm away and um, you know from there she took off and uh, you know I opened my uh, champs in 2017 and then I opened my restaurant and the barbershop and uh, you know recently three years ago I opened uh, champs in UAE but you know she helped me a lot she's a she's an incredible 
uh, CEO and general manager for the company. She's a uh, woman. Usually they are strict in, uh, in managing uh, businesses. And uh, she is. She's doing extremely well. I love it. Looking uh, beyond sport and businesses. Um, there's other things going on in life that are more important. And one thing I love about you, you're very well outspoken. And you've always spoken on behalf of the people and for what's right. And you've been very vocal about the Palestinian situation that's going on right now. And I know Abudi and I, when we launched this, uh, our podcast again during the break we took for what's going on in Gaza. Um, how did you feel talking about it? Uh, especially someone of your character, um, someone that's very big in the public, um, huge followers. Did you feel in any way it's going to affect you? Is going to, you're going to get any backlash? No, 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 no. Zero. I mean, because they know, people know that when I talk about something, I'm honest. I'm talking about it with my, you know, with my full heart. I'm not, you know, acting or I'm not doing it for publicity or more followers or more. No, I'm doing it because I used to do this when we had issues in Lebanon and I've done it. And, um, you know, I was shot. Um, um, uh, when, when we were on the street in Lebanon. Um, uh, so, so this case is our case. Gaza is our case. The kids are our families. The, the, the people dying there, they are us. So how on earth any creature or any person or any, uh, uh, you know, mature person watching this Want, if he will not support this, then there is an issue in his, in himself. It's a must to support what we are saying. It's a must to support the case. It's a must to support this. You cannot not support this. You have to support this. It's a must to support this. It's a must to stand with the Palestinians and their case and their, their, their land and what they should get back. Uh, because at the end of the day, and, <laughs> you know, Imagine someone entering your house and kicking you off. You will fight your, your you know, you'll fight with your life uh, to to stay in your house. So, you know, it's and and with that, a genocide is happening. So, and I know a lot of things that's happening, and it's a politics, and it's a word. Uh, thing politics and it's a it's a, a long term deal that should happen for the whole uh, region and 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 but man kids um, elderly I can't see a kid suffering and I can't see an elderly suffering probably if if my age will suffer you know you can handle it we can handle it a kid an elderly there is no way on earth they can handle what's happening, you know? And, um, and th that's where, you know, we, we spend hours crying. And, you know, if we see something on, on the social media, uh, your whole day would be, uh, done and gone. And you have, I mean, I, I really can't uh, see any, celebrity or a huge uh, who, uh, any person who got a huge fan base not stepping in supporting this case at all my page will always be as i have it now this page is dedicated or committed to support gaza i mean all the way um, um i mean um we've done it and we will keep on doing it with whatever uh, uh power we have you know, when we first shot the episode with the with our previous production company, the one that we didn't actually post, I remember telling you before the episode started, listen, we're gonna we're not gonna talk about this because we don't know what the implications are gonna be. And it was the first time I I think I'd properly met you, right? We played against each other once, but I remember your look of disappointment. And I remember turning to Sam and being like, I don't even know that man, but I feel like I just really, really disappointed him. And me as a Palestinian, right, being a little bit worried about what or not to say. So I want you to know that. A, a large part of me and Sam's decision to release that episode on Palestine 
a couple of weeks ago was inspired by the fact that you kind of showed us the way and and inspired us to to understand our our obligation, right? We're both Palestinian. We both have a voice. Sam specifically is is extremely well respected in the region, just like you. And and I, I want to thank you, honestly, because I, I will remember the look on your face for the rest of my life when I said, I don't know if we're going to speak about this. I remember thinking, fuck, I just upset Fadi al Khatib, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, speaking the truth nowadays, uh, Aboudi is, uh, is the best thing you can do in your life. I mean, there is, uh, there is, you know, we're 45, I'm 45. You know, half of our time is gone and half of our life is gone. So, so I don't know how long uh we're gonna be living for and um and i learned one thing and to give it all i mean with honesty with our heart and uh with everything we got i mean i have zero hate and jealousy to any person who's living in this life zero 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 and i say you know truth and supporting cases and supporting uh, what you have to do, what you have to support in the right way, is the best thing you'll do. So, Fadi, you mentioned how how difficult it is to, for you to see obviously kids suffering. We've covered a lot in this episode between your basketball career, your career as as a businessman, your ability to speak out against injustice. One thing we've yet to discuss, and one thing that's so fundamental to who you are, is is your family, right? And I can imagine how proud of you your your wife and kids are for for speaking out, for showing them the right way. Talk us through what it's like now sending your kids away. A lot, you know, jihad specifically, who's older, who's talented, who's approaching the, the stage of of being, you know, potentially a division one basketball player. What's it been like for you trying to let them know that, you know, you expect greatness from them, but that they don't have to be Fadi Al Khatib. They can, you know, they can pave their own way in this world. I mean, every time uh, uh, I'm asked about the kids and uh, you know, it, uh, and how how tough it is to be away from them, it's 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 very difficult not to, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's the worst thing. It's to to a dad and mom that can happen to any dad of and mom to be away from from their kids especially that you know they're 15 uh, when jihad left us and hadi after you know that he was 15 when he left us so it's been jihad's been three years and hadi's been uh, a year now and you know for a fact if you think about it they will not they will not live with you unless they're on vacations anymore now they're gone they have their future unless you relocate and stay next to them. And it's, it's, uh, and, and with that, it comes the selfishness. And I told my wife, you know, you want to be, we want to be selfish. We want, you want to be selfish and think about us and our emotions. Let's keep them here. We want to think about their life and their career. They have to leave. I mean, to a better situation. And they're, um, you know, um, I'm super proud of them. I always tell them, you know, you don't, um, be yourself. Do your own road. Don't take my road. Do your own road. Create your own road. My road wasn't that easy. Now you have an easiest road. You have people supporting you. Our times, we didn't have the facilities, the support, the people around us who wanted to guide us in a, in a, in a, into the right direction. And we were, we were taking our own way. Now they have the right people around uh, them. They have the right road and, you know, and they are taking this seriously. And um, uh, uh, they have a lot to learn and they have a lot to work on. Um, and they are doing this. And one thing is they are well raised. They're de- dedicated, committed and disciplined. And, um, you know, uh, they fear no pressure at all. Um, and they, they, they have this goal in their mind. You know, they want to achieve it. And I'm supporting them. You know, I have to support my kids. If I see it's the right thing, I'm there for them. I'm supporting them. Unless I see, you know, no, it's the wrong road. 
take a different direction and I guide them to the different direction, definitely with their agent and, and so, because now, yes, they have this father that, you know, did a lot into basketball, but at the end of the day, they will keep on listening to you as a father, not as an athlete and an expert player. Whatever I will do, they will not take Fadi as an athlete and an ex-player and, you know, someone who did a lot into basketball, but they will listen to it as a father. And us, from the experience, if your father is pressuring you and annoying you with with the requests and, and, and this, you'll get, you know, uh, offended sometimes and you will be... Uh, angry and mad sometimes and you will not take things seriously sometimes and this is what I don't want. So the balance between me and their coaches and their agent is there to guide them in the right way. So sometimes I, when I see that they will not listen to what I want to say, you know, I talk to the coaches and I talk to the agent and they, they do the, the job. Uh, because they will listen to them more than me. Yeah, although, Fadi, you have a great relationship with your family, mashallah. One thing I loved about it, I mean, they have a friend and a father. Uh, but how tough is it when you watch them play basketball, honestly? Is it hard? <laughs> I don't, man. I don't. I don't. Usually, I don't watch basketball at all. Abudi, remember, this is, this is one of the... Best, if not the best Asian player. He doesn't watch no more basketball. Yeah, because knowing Fadi, he probably wants to get on the court and start playing as soon as he watches. You know, even when we used to play, the only time I watched basketball is the video sessions. So I don't sit and watch games, final games, semifinal games or whatsoever. Because why, I, you know, my hands start sweating. I'll be like, you know, I cannot stand or sit behind the screen, watch a decisive moment happening and I'm not there. And, um, you know, and, and w- w- when it start getting worse is when I watch my kids. Oh God, that's the worst thing. <laughs> you don't, if my, if my wife will send some clips of one or two games I ever watched my kids, probably, you know, the people will be going, this is, uh, definitely an insane, a crazy person that lives on earth. He's definitely abnormal. He's not normal. Uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, it's super funny to watch me watching, uh, their games. And then she literally told me, please don't watch anymore, uh, Jihad and Hadi playing. Don't watch Jihad playing at all. Any mistake, any normal mistake that we used to do in our life. Normal mistake. It's like, uh, you know, the whole room, my voice and, uh, you know, the, the, the table, the, everything will be turned upside down, down in, uh, in the room. And then I said, you know, I will not watch basketball. I will not watch my kids. If, uh, they will, they will send me highlights after the, after the game. That's it. I'm sure you had to have some, uh, some crazy highlights. I've seen, I've seen, Plenty of videos in hooping, and he looks like he's going to be a, a proper hooper one day. But Fadi, as we enter the sort of final uh, section of our podcast, this is going to be called the three peat. We're just going to ask you three broader questions on life, and feel free to answer in any sort of capacity as you want. All right? Okay. What advice would you give a young athlete that is looking to start a business? As I said, I mean, um, uh, it's the same. Uh, Four main things that, you know, any person playing basketball, playing sports or doing business, faith, commitment, dedication and discipline. They need to have this and they need to be on top of their uh, businesses. And as I said in the episode, they need to be involved. If you were in a room with everybody you ever met, who would you gravitate to and why? Michael Jordan. Wow. That's a good one. I mean, definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, because, you know, I, I met, I, I, I stayed with him for two months and it was probably the best thing that happened to me in my entire life. It was after, 
after the world championship in uh, 2002 in Indianapolis, and I uh, was invited to Tim Grover by Tim Grover to stay with him for two months. And I met Michael Jordan and he was picking me every single day in his pickup games. Um, man, I, you know, I would just sit with him, learn from his mindset and mentality and his toughness and how he did it, or at least if I can sit with him for one hour and, you know, understand more about uh, his mindset and mentality, it will be, you know, uh, the best thing ever happened. Although I saw it, I learned from him while we were in the court because the only time it was in the gym and in the court, we didn't have a lot to chat on. Uh, but with that, with him, just me, with me in the gym and pushing me and on the court and pushing me on the court and with, with only this, it changed my life. It changed my career. It changed everything. And after 2003, when I came back, I was a completely different player just because of those two months. So I, definitely I will, Michael Jordan will be the person. 100%. And actually, I'm going to switch my question up. Um, speaking of that, do you believe every athlete should have a mentor? Do you believe mentorship is very important? You know, as I said, uh, Sam, before, in life there is no perfection. We have a lot of things that we do wrong, and you have to correct. By correcting them, you need to be surrounded by a mentor, by someone you look up to, by an advisor and consultant and um, life coach, whatsoever, what, whatever you want to call, probably your friend, but you have to have advices in life. You have to have a mentor in life. You have to have a, someone you look up to, you learn from, you learn from their mistakes, you learn from their career, you learn from their uh, experience. And it's, it's very important because Whatever we're going to be doing, Sam, in our life, and uh, um, we we will be doing a lot of wrong stuff. We'll be, you know, uh, we'll have mistakes. And this is this is the nature of every single person. And this is life because there is no, as again, perfection. So that's why we need those people around us. Fadi, I know you have a, a decades-long friendship with Sam. So... I'm sure he's going to have plenty to thank you for. But from my end, I just want to say thank you so much, not only for coming on today, for obviously repeating the episode. You are an inspiration, whether it's from showing us that you can have a six pack at 44 to showing us how to build, you know, generational businesses. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your lessons. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Abudi. Pleasure. Habibi Fadi, thank you once again from a brother to a brother. I always appreciate you having you on the phone or texting or having a cup of coffee with you. It always means the world. And I wish you and the family best of luck, Habibi. And thank you again for taking the time. Sam, and I cannot thank you enough. I know uh, the last three weeks we should have gone into many things and it's, it's my, it's my fault. I always say, yeah, I always say, you know, uh, but, but what's, what's good about this, that, you know, uh, uh, the love and the respect and, um, ad I admire you as a person, as a player. And this, I'm not saying this on the episode. I've said it million times before I, you, this is for people to know when I used to watch Sam, I used to be motivated by his game. I used to love watching this kind of player playing. I, you motivated me. You motivated every single player on, in Asia and in the, in the world championship. Uh, keep doing what you are doing. Uh, you have my full support and we will be doing something together. And this is an announcement to every single person. Uh, watching this episode. I love you, Sam, as a brother, as a player, and as a friend. I love you too, Habibi. Sam, I know there's so much we could point out from that episode. I mean, the guy is inspirational. He's done so much on and off the court. I actually had no idea he spent so much time with Michael Jordan. That's a pretty crazy story. And to think that Michael, you know, used to pick him for his pickup games, it kind of makes sense when you think about what kind of player Fadi is. He's a dog. But to have that kind of exposure to one of the greatest players of all time, to have 
you know, one-on-one time with him, I, I can understand why Fadi would pick him as, you know, anyone he would reach out to if he was in a room. And actually that explains where that motivation comes from within Fadi. I mean, I'm sure he learned so much uh, from MJ and he brought it back to Lebanon. And I mean, like he's, uh, like he told us, 21 out of 24 championships. That's insane. And the three that he didn't win, he was playing somewhere else outside of Lebanon. It's just insane. I mean, the guy competing in, uh, against him for so many years, uh, I'm telling you, he did motivate me. He was the guy that I always looked at and I wanted to win more, champ- more championships than him. Um, I always had a goal. I didn't want to lose any championships in Jordan and I was undefeated in Jordan, never lost a championship. Um, and also when we used to play in uh, Asia championship against each other, I was able to win one. Uh, he won, I think, two championships um, from me. The only tournament I was able to beat that guy was Dubai because, I mean, his will to win was un- unreal, man. Thank you for everyone tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and all our other channels. Wherever you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe on that platform because it makes the biggest difference for Sam and I.